It's Torah talk. 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 We are witnesses and watchmen of Torah. Welcome to Torah Talk with Lou White and Mark Davidson. A Torah Institute podcast. <laughs> it's the Torah Zone. In the center, the son of man, in a robe and gold breastplate, hair a blizzard of white, eyes pouring fire blaze, both feet finest fire bronze, his voice a cataract, right hand holding seven stars, his mouth a sharp biting sword, his face a perigee sun. I saw this and fainted dead at his feet. His right hand pulled me upright, his voice reassured me. Don't fear, I am first, I am last. I am alive, I died, but I came to life. My life is now forever, and I have come to take you home. Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. It's uh, Torah Talk time again. I'm Mark Davidson, and I'm joined by Lou White. So, had a busy week, brother. Oh, you would not believe this week. It's uh, <laughs> my whole body is aching. Yeah. You know, yeah. our uh, our one employee that we have at the store, you know that that shop, went out of town, and Bob and I were the only ones to wait on all the customers. So all week long, and she was supposed to be back yesterday, and she didn't make it. She had a little mishap, you know. But uh, so we, are, yeah, we're really uh, we're pretty pretty tired. Hmm. But uh, yeah. we're, we're we rested all day today, and you know it's the first day of the week for you, but it's still the last part of Sabbath for us. So we're hmm. having a wonderful rest. Yeah. Oh, you know? Fantastic. Well, I was uh, fortunate to get a spontaneous call from Brother Colin a couple of days ago. He was testing out his Skype, and uh, oh. we, uh, he said, Brother, I uh, need someone to test my Skype on. You're always online, so can I Skype you? I said, Go for it, mate. And uh, we Skyped, and uh, turned into about an hour, I think, we were chatting. It was wonderful. You know? That's great, yeah. What a lovely guy. Yes, you know? indeed, isn't he? And he's wife Tina and I just always assumed and we had a laugh about it I always assumed that because you forwarded emails on him to help you know answer emails and things with you I just always assumed he was an old bloke like you and you know, it turns out when I clicked on he was about my age yeah. I got a shock <laughs> so yeah it was a uh, always shocking yeah it is <laughs> to see the person 
And, yeah. uh, you know, you never can tell what, from the way a person writes because they, you know, when I didn't know Chris Coster was an older gentleman, you know, he just seemed like so, so youthful, yeah. you know. Mm. Um, so anyway, we have a, a lot of material about this, but, you know, we don't have to make it complicated at all. Yeah. But the lamb is the is the objective of our studies, and uh, when people observe Passover, a lot of times they confuse the word itself with uh, what they're doing. You know, when it's in fact only concerning the lamb, and he's already done what he did. This, these are shadows that we're recognizing and remembering and observing, and even the Yahudim. Uh, all through the thousands of years since, well, th since the Exodus, they have not really understood that this was a foreshadowing of something that was even bigger. You know, because mm -hmm. when they came out of Mitzrayim, that was a great deliverance indeed. But mm -hmm. there's going to be another second Exodus. And you know what that points to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the <laughs> first resurrection. <laughs> and uh, the second Exodus is when the Lamb returns. And uh, for the second time, and they recognize him. And in Zechariah 14, they will look upon the one whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as, a, as if for, a, for an only child. And uh, anyway, they'll recognize him at that time, the unbelief, but uh, the unbelievers will. But I, I uh, prepared a little chart here, which looks really complicated, but... Actually, I want to point out one thing before we even get into this, but a lot of people are going to argue about, you're not doing it at the right time, it's this time. And, you know, uh, we need to try to do the best we can to understand it. But you know what? He's already done it. You know, so all we're really doing is remembering. And our objective is to remember, and when we're remembering it is all well and good, but, uh, you know... Anyway, what we've got here is we've got black and white and black and white. These represent the nighttime part of the day. Now, some of the messianics start their day at the at, at day at uh, dawn, but uh, I want to just start off by saying, well, look at Nehemiah chapter thirteen, verse nineteen, and it says very clearly when the day starts. The day it starts. Um, I'll try to read this. Um, 19 we have to know when the day starts really you know if we don't know that we're confused i mean read genesis chapter 1 you know but it says in in uh, nehemiah chapter 13 they had a problem with people observing sabbath and they wouldn't do it they were having merchants come in the gates and anyway he says and it came to be when the gates of jerusalem were shaded in other words when the shadows started to form before the sabbath that I commanded the doors to be shut and commanded that they should not be opened until after the Sabbath. And I stationed some of my servants at the gates so that any no burdens would be brought in on the Sabbath day. So he's talking about the shadows or the gates being shaded just before the Sabbath. And he's talking about when the sun's going down, you know. So anyway, uh, if anybody has any problem with that, and then we have also Yom Kafar or Yom Teru, uh, Yom, yeah, Yom Kafar to look at, uh, so when we know when to keep our fast, you know, I think the fast is uh, from evening to evening, from the ninth day at evening when the sun's going down until the tenth day at evening when the sun's going down, you know, so we're talking evening is the Hebrew word Arab, which means darkening, you know, the day is darkening and that's when the Sabbath begins and that's when the Sabbath also ends. Anyway, that's, uh, look at Nehemiah thirteen nineteen, the growing dark or before the Sabbath. And then also consider Leviticus 23 verse 32, which discusses when the fast is. It goes from evening through the, from the ninth in the evening until the 10th in the evening. So we know it isn't from morning to morning that you're fasting. And of course, some people will say, well, that's just an exception. Well, there's two exceptions that we just pointed out, and that's getting kind of creepy, isn't it? 
But, uh, you know, when you get too many exceptions to the rule that you want, besides, you know, when you, when you start making up your own rules, you kind of kind of remind yourself of what everyone is doing and they're doing whatever is right in their own eyes. And, you know, you ought to look, consider Deuteronomy 12, verse 8, Judges 17, verse 6, and Judges 21, verse 25, and Proverbs 21, verse 2. Because we don't do what is right in our own observation we we kind of get together as a group we're not individuals we're we're a body you know yeah yeah, yeah. you know so let's get with the body you know <laughs> but um don't follow lou white i mean look at the scriptures i just read these scriptures to you you know um and if they're tricking me they can trick you just as easily <laughs> you know <laughs> anyway what we have here is a definition of terms i wanted to start off with when we say the word passover it's the Hebrew word Pesach, and it does point to the Exodus when the firstborn was slain, but the covering of the Israelites was done by the blood of the Lamb, and that was a foreshadowing of Messiah and his blood that was going to cover our hearts, sprinkle our hearts. Now, on the 14th day, the instructions, if you read Exodus or Shemoth, chapter 12, you really should read that whole chapter because he keeps saying things over and over and over and it's easy to get he he keeps repeating that the first moon of the year to you to you is that be, this is the beginning of moons now i want to also point out to all of you messianics that the wave sheath offering or the first fruits or the barley or whatever though that's a shadow too it does not have anything to do with recognizing the first moon and yet, you'll see people sending out all these essays that you must find the barley in the land, hiding under a rock or in a field, and it has to be in the head before the first moon gets there. This stuff isn't like that. This, it has, that doesn't set the year or the first month or anything. That's just something that's done. If you read Leviticus 23, when you go into the land, that's, it's an afterthought. It has nothing to do with setting that when the first month is. But I'll read that to you, too. Mm. I've got that all prepared for you. But, uh, and it, you know, I know a lot of people are saying, oh, he's wrong about that. That's what, not what I believe. Well, we're going to look at the Scripture itself, okay? Anyway, the word Passover, Pesach, we're referring to the lamb itself. That's what we're really talking about. Uh, it's not so much a time, although all of the whole period of unleavened bread is referred to as Pesach. However, it technically is the lamb itself. And the lamb is slain between the evenings. Usually it's bet I thought of as sometimes people say between the going down of the sun and sunset, you know, on the 14th. The 14th is not a Sabbath. Neither is it a day of unleavened bread because the day of unleavened bread begins at sunset on the 15th see but you do eat the the lamb with unleavened bread and for seven days you keep leaven out of your houses but here's the thing the Passover is slain on the 14th that does not mean that it is the Passover time right there. It means that it's very near, though, because at sunset, it, it, on the 15th, is when the Passover is traditionally, and in fact scripturally, to be eaten. Because it wasn't to have anything left over at sun, at sun, uh, when the sun comes up. If there was anything left over, it was to be burned with fire thoroughly. But... Uh, during that night on the 15th, Yahuwah went through the land and slayed all the firstborn of the whole land, uh, even of animals. And it's a night of watching or a night of vigil. Exodus 12, verse 42, describes it as a night of watching or the night of watches. You know, and uh, we're, we're supposed to stay up and keep a vigil because that's a very... <laughs> It's a, a, a command for all of us all the time. But uh, it, it also reflects the first night that Yahushua was in the tomb 
which is also the sign of Yonah, three days and three nights. So he went into the tomb just before sunset on the 14th. The lamb was slain and the blood was offered. You know, of course, you know, some would say, well, no, his blood really wasn't offered until he waved himself. At the, you know, and that was after his resurrection. But the whole point is the lamb was slain. So the Passover, the Passover is the lamb himself, you know. It, it, it's uh, not anything we are doing, really. You know, it's all about pointing to him. And people are told to slaughter lambs and wherever they are, and there's prohibitions against that. You know, in Leviticus 23, it says you're not to, to slay a lamb wherever you are. You're supposed to do it in only in the, the place, not places, but the place where he has established his name. You know, and that's, of course, where in Jerusalem. Now, we're scattered into the realm, into the world, but uh, this Passover is the lamb himself, and the time of the slaying of the lamb, not the eating of the lamb. Now, can we make that distinction? Because a lot of people are confusing the word Passover with what we do to remember him. And we are remembering him at the beginning of the 14th as he instructed his disciples to do. And it was at the beginning of the 14th that he sat down with his disciples and he showed them the bread and the, and the cup. And he said what it represented, the new covenant in his blood. The next day, of course, the morning side, not the next day, but the next morning, it was still the 14th. Then the lamb was slain, and the sins of the world were placed upon him by that Roman soldier, probably. When they, when they pushed the thorns down upon his head, your sins went upon his head. Now, here's the thing, mine too, <laughs> everybody. And anyway, the, the, the sin offering, he became a sin offering. And, uh, the, but the lamb, the Passover, was slain on the 14th as prescribed. Now, the Passover was observed both in Mitzrayim or Egypt and by the Yahudim at the time of Yahushua's death uh, at, the be at the beginning of the 15th. We're still learning this, but when you read Exodus 12, and put it together with everything that you read in the brief Kadasha. It's going to become very crystal clear. But uh, anyway, this is an annual Sabbath, and it extends from sunset on the 15th until sunset on the 15th, at the beginning of the 16th. And that's an annual Sabbath. And if you want to read Psalm 81, verse 3, you'll see that in the Kodesh, which is the new moon, you're to blow the shofar, and in the full moon, that's the full moon. This is the 15th day. The full moon, the day of our festival, you know. So anyway, three days and three nights later, Yahushua was raised, the week that he was ex executed, at the end of the Sabbath, which happened to be that week, that week that he died facilitated the sign of Yonah because he was in for three nights and three days. And the sign of Yonah would it would require him to raise at the end of the Sabbath. Now, the first day of the week would have come immediately after that. And then the next morning, Miriam went to the tomb, discovered that the, that the stone was removed, and she was really upset and uh, ran back and got Eleazar and, and, Peter, and Peter. And, of course, they come rushing out, and they... Uh, and, of course, El Elazar is bragging about it. He says, I was faster than the old man. I got there first. He even wrote that down. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. So he gets there, and he, he, he sees, he peeks in, and he sees, uh, you know, that the, the, the body's not there, and notices that the, 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 the body part was still wrapped up, but there was no body in it, and there was a head piece that was wrapped up neatly and folded or folded up neatly where the head had lain but um, anyway while there um, Miriam is wondering what happened to the body and she uh, encounters the two messengers 
and the messengers say, what are you crying for? What, who are you looking for? And of course they uh, explain that he's, he's raised, he's risen. And of course she hears some, she, she's probably, her face is filled with tears. She hears someone behind her, assuming it to be the gardener, pleads with him, where have you taken him? If you know, tell me and I'll go and, 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 and I'll get him. And uh, then he says, Miriam, and she recognizes his voice, and she says, Rabboni, you know, my rabbi. And um, she's rushing up to him and he says, do not touch me. I have not yet ascended to my father. Now that's because he's the wave sheaf. Your phone came out. He's the wave sheaf. He is the first fruits. That's what the waving of the barley was all about. So that's another element that we have to understand that the Yahudim don't know what they're doing when they wave the, well, when they, they don't do that anymore, but when they did, the, only the high priest would be able to wave the sheep. Well, he is the high priest and his, his own body is the first fruits. And he waved in the real temple, you know. And uh, he was telling Miriam and Yahukanan or John chapter 20, verse 17, touch me not. I have not yet raised, uh, send it to my father. But um, those are all elements that we have to overcome the definitions of and get the events straightened out. But the sign of Jonah is real. It is nothing like the Christians have embraced. You know, not that we're condemning anybody, you know. But uh, this year, we can talk about it, you know. So he must have ascended uh, and presented himself or waved waved himself between the time he told Miriam not to touch me and between the time he appeared to his followers and said, touch me. Right. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> and when he did appear, it was later that same day and they were locked in a room for fear of the Yahudim and Phil, I think it was Thomas. Thomas wasn't there. Toma was not there. And, uh, Everybody was, he said, Shalom Alechem several times and, and then, you know, explained that he was raised and he said, you know, touch, put, you put your finger in my wounds. And, uh, of course, a week later, I think it was eight days later, that uh, Toma was in the group and he said, put your finger in, my, in, in these wounds and uh, you'll see that it is me, you know. And uh, that was a wonderful moment, but uh, yeah, doubting is uh, is very human, and uh, he was just really upset too. But uh, it seemed like he would have believed his close friends. But of course, witness witnesses to the resurrection uh, is a very special thing. They they were witnesses mm -hmm. of something that had never ever happened. You know, they saw him being killed and tortured. They were with him just the night before, and then here he is in the tomb for three days and three nights, and now he's back. You know, there's no doubt, you know, that he's he's not the normal person that, you know, is he's not like us anymore. But um, no. so if the um, if Yahusha, when he was raised up, and he came, they they recognized him. He looked the same. Why do you think um, Miriam? And there's another case, wasn't there, where he was walking along with some emissaries mm -hmm. and the, chatting Same with day. them, and and they didn't know who they didn't know who he was. Why? Why do you? I mean, today you're like, oh, yeah, hey, can't like you, you? Did you know what yeah. people look like? Why do you think that was something supernatural that he had shrouded them or just blinded them temporarily to make a point? Or you don't think he would look different, do you? Well, I think that he probably was. I mean, given what we were given it would seem that they didn't recognize him until the, the very end when he broke bread in front of them and then, mm. then he disappeared and they said did not our hearts burn within us but uh, I, I don't know the answer to that but I would assume what you said it's mm. the only logical conclusion that they did not recognize mm. him and uh, he was keeping himself from being recognized but, um, you know, they, 
uh, often, uh, you know, when you meet somebody, usually you exchange names too, <laughs> you know, but apparently it wasn't necessarily the custom of, for that, for them. And I don't, I don't know the answer to that either, but, uh, it would seem so, you know, in fact, we're not really, really identifying the two, uh, travelers there. Um, anyway, we have, uh, the lamb as the redeemer of all mankind being, coming through Israel, the nation of Israel, that's paid for the ransom and the leprosy of all mankind, you know. A lot of people don't know, but leprosy is is a symbol of for sinfulness, you know. And uh, our, uh, our rescuer, our redeemer, is this person that we know as Yahusha. But um, anyway... Uh, where, where can we start off here? Uh, we've got a lot of uh, information here, but I want to keep it really simple because we have to understand that we all are dying. When we're born into this world, some of us don't even make it into the world. We just die in the womb. Uh, but we've inherited a leprosy condition that's spread from Adam, you know. And uh, well, I, well, I was interested to, if you went through the... Um... What I found interesting when you went through that Lamb, Lamb of Elohim, mm -hmm. Lamb Legacy mm -hmm. seminar was how intricate and it was a bit complicated. So if you explained it, it'd probably make it really simple. Just how there there was sheep and goats and doves and you name it, it was there, and it, and they had to be slaughtered and laid out in certain mm -hmm. spots, and there was red cords and this and that and all those little things that and it all pointed to Yahusha. Yeah. I, I yeah, found that they, amazing. It is, but I. Well, the, the blood of the lamb is the main focus of our attention and the processes that the, pre, the priests and uh, the congregation of Israel had to go through to bring the scapegoat and so forth, those are all, you know, foreshadows. You know, in fact, there's one text here that I should probably bring up. We, we mentioned this a couple of other times in Colossians chapter 2. There's this word, chirographon, which is translated certificate of debt. It's a, it's a, actually the list of our accusations that was nailed or, you know, it was blotted out. And uh, it was basically starting out in verse 13. It says, and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him having forgiven you all trespasses, having blotted out their certificate of debt, that's the Cairo Griffon that was nailed to the stake, against us by the dogmas, that's where they get the word Torah or ordinances. In other words, it was a certificate of debt that was against us because of our transgressions, which stood against us, and he has taken it out of the way that's the Cairo Griffon, the list of our, our offenses, the evidence against us. Having nailed it to the stake, he himself was nailed to the stake, and he became the, the blotting, he blotted out the certificate of debt. Having stripped the principalities and authorities, he made a public display of them, having prevailed over them in it. Let no one Therefore, judge you in eating or in drinking or in respect of a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of what is to come for the body of Messiah. Of course, the word but is in your translation, but I think that the uh, better translation is for the body of Messiah. The word but in the Greek is, is mm. interchangeable with our understanding for the word for. So read that again. Let no one therefore judge you in eating or in drinking or in respect of a festival or a new moon or Sabbath, which are, these things I just mentioned, are a shadow of what is to come for the body of Messiah. So the shadow, the, the, the annual festivals like Passover, unleavened bread, Shabuoth or Pentecost and all the fall festivals are shadows that are pictures of what is what is to come. They're they're something that that they reflect and they and they just are shadows of 
the the thing that they're that's casting the shadow is even more important. But uh, everything we do mm. when we observe things like Passover, we're just performing a shadow. It's just a shadow, and there's no reason for us to lo to be unloving toward one another if we have misunderstandings about what day it is, or or even well, we all know what it means pretty much. I hope, maybe most mostly, at least we get most of that. But uh, the elements of the uh, observance itself, we can either have food or have no food. It doesn't really matter because he, these are shadows, you know. You can have a process, a seder, and that's fine. You know, it's a good teaching tool. Mm. But uh, that's that Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 17, bring out quite a bit that relate to all these festivals. So so, so you mentioned the word um, caro grafont. Um, yes, we understand from that that it, it was not the instructions themselves or the law that was nailed to Yahushua's stake. It was the consequence, it was the actual disobedience, lawlessness against mm -hmm. those instructions and the consequence of it that was nailed to exactly. Yahushua, wasn't it? Yeah, if we, so the law, if, we, if he took yeah, away yeah. the thing that defines sin, then we would not know what to do at all. We would be completely lawless. He didn't... Because you see, people have misunderstood. They haven't properly studied the words themselves. Because the Messiah, his goal is to be in each of us and be enthroned on our uh, personality. So that the, the thing that we see in each other is not the person, but him. That's, that's really his goal. And if we operate our lives thinking we're in control and we want to just ga gain the whole world when uh, that's the natural mind of the flesh well then he's not enthroned in your heart but if you are allowing him to take control and you understand and study scripture with his mind then you get the simplicity of the truth because it's really not complicated mm. and I don't want to make it complicated by all these uh, things, but we'll try to uh, cover this stuff. If you if you think of something that might be needing more explanation, let me know. Um, yeah. Let's see. Um, anyway, we're the redemption of our bodies is what's really yet ahead. But we're fallen beings. We have leprosy, and the leprosy we can see in the aging of a person. If you're looking at a person that's really young, and then you come back and check them 30 years later, <laughs> and then check them 20 more years later, if they're still alive, you'll see the leprosy, you know, that's progressing. It's sinfulness, it's death, it's living in your body, you know. And it's because time is passing, and the Lamb of Elohim is able to give you eternal life not of your fleshly body, because it's appointed once to die. And after this, the judgment. And, but the renewing of your mind with his mind is going to enable you to have eternal life. You know. Uh, anyway, the, re the significance of redemption, I want to explain that. Exodus 13, verses 9 through 11 says, And it shall be assigned to you on your hand as a reminder between your eyes, that the Torah of Yahuwah is to be in your mouth. and For with a strong hand, Yahuwah has brought you out of Mitzrayim, and you shall guard this law at its appointed time from year to year to observe Passock or Passover. So that's what Passover is given as a sign for, that we are to remind ourselves that the Torah of Yahuwah is to be in your mouth because he brought you out of Mitzrayim and gave you the Torah, you know. And it shall be when Yahuwah brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers and gives it to you, and you shall pass over to Yahuwah every one opening the womb, every firstborn that comes from your livestock, the males belong to Yahuwah. 
For every, for every firstborn of a donkey, you are to ransom with a lamb. And if you do not ransom it, then you are to break its neck. And every firstborn of every man among your sons, you are to ransom. But notice that it says when you come into the land, you know, and that pertains to the barley also. It's when you come into the land. Now, we're in, we're in captivity right now, but the land is still there and the barley is still there coming and going, but uh, there's no high priest needing to wave it right now, you know. But its function is not and never was to identify the first month because when that sun, when the, when the earth is, is passing along in the orbit and its tilt arranges for the sun to be right at the equator again, it looks like the sun is coming up from the, from the, you know, from where you are, it's going down, but it's going away from you, but you're on the uh, Southern hemisphere, but for the Northern hemisphere, the sun reaches the equator, the vegetation comes back and Yahuwah stirs up more water precipitation and the plants come back. And of course, uh, it, it's not gonna have any problem going to be, it'll be there, you know, in the grain. The, the, Abib means grain, it does not mean green ears. Abib means grain. And if you watch a grass grow, and if you don't cut it for a couple of weeks, it will reach its seed stage. It'll go to seed. And you'll say, wow, they aren't cutting their grass over there. It's because that stuff goes real fast. It flashes up. It's a fast growing plant. Barley is exactly the same way. It goes to seed real fast. And you don't have to, if you wait until the barley goes to seed, and then you wait until the next new moon, then that's your first moon, then you're going to be a whole month late, you know. <laughs> you know, the Takufa is when winter ends, and that's when the sun hits the equator. And, you know, it, and it can be a little before, too, because the zone that the sun gets in, it isn't like this one place. It isn't like the Naval Observatory likes to say, well, it's there now. Bam. Well, yeah, okay, but it's been there for quite a while. It's spread out over three, four, five days. You know, so if if the new moon comes and the and the sun is anywhere near the equator, then the first, the next new moon is the new moon because you got to go through twenty nine and a half more days and you know. Uh, anyway, the Hebrew calendar is very confusing for people, but uh, this month it's very similar as far as this year to the to the Islamic calendar. And I don't uh, have any problem with that necessarily, but uh, sometimes it's way different, and it's far different from the Roman one. Uh, anyway, we have... Uh, go ahead. Did you have a question? I was just going to say that this year in Australia, the, um, the Sabbath day that we have to take off, or the preparation day, I should say, Mm -hmm. After the night of the vigil, the next day, the preparation day, is actually on good FRI day <laughs> this year in Australia. Well, you know, it is true that there's a, a rule that the Catholics have had since the days of Constantine that they don't observe their EASTER if it happens to be on the same day as Passover. They move it to the next mm -hmm. week. And of course, they'll tell you that that's because it can't be that there could be a resurrection at the same time that Yahushua was killed. You know, <laughs> and of course that's yeah. logical. But we're looking at something that's a shadow of the past anyway. It's uh, yeah. they should be observing Passover. See, they talk about the Paschal Lamb. I mean, I was raised a Catholic, and they they discuss the the Paschal Lamb. Well, the word Paschal is the Hebrew attempt to transliterate Pesach. The Passover lamb is what they're saying, but they don't have a Passover. They don't observe Passover. They just ignore it. They have their uh, little ash, you know, I can't really say the name of the day of the week, but they start off their 40 days of fasting, which is a fasting for Tammuz, and then the resurrection at the end of that 
And, uh, you know, but they're, where, where's the Passover? You know, they just don't have it. Because Constantine arranged for them to have nothing to do with the, you know, the laws that the hostile rabble of what they call the hostile rabble of the Yahudim observe. But um, it's so sad. He thought it was a bad thing, but uh, let's see. Anyway, um, in First Yahukanan chapter 3, it says, Everyone doing sin also does lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. So he, when he took away our sins, he was taking away the penalty for our sins. You know, the chirographon, the blotting out of the accusations that were against us. And that's what Colossians 2 is referring to. And the, uh, that reflects the process that the high priest had to do when he took these two goats and he put the sins upon the head of the, scape, of the scapegoat. And the uh, covering for sin uh, was, was put in the form of a ribbon around the neck of the, it was a, a red ribbon, I think, yeah. And uh, they turned the, 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 the scapegoat loose into the wilderness. And then it would return, and it would have, the ribbon would have returned white. And that was a miracle. And the other goat, of course, was slain. You know, it was a sin offering. So uh, there were uh, there, that was going on in uh, in the temple period. Now uh, now we have one lamb that's made an offering, and uh, let's see. In in Yeshayahu fifty three, which is one place in the scriptures that they generally skip over in the synagogues the Yahudim. It's uh, very interesting. It says in, in Yeshayahu 53, starting in verse 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised for our crookednesses and the chastisement for our peace was, up, was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. So that's referring to all the things that happened to him. He was pierced and bruised and he had stripes you know it kind of looks like a matzah cracker you know mm -hmm. they're all pierced and there's bruising it looks like and you know the stripes we all like sheep went astray each one of us has turned to his own way and Yahuwah has laid on him the crookednesses of us all now that is the Cairo Graphon you know, the handwriting of or that was evidence against us for transgressions. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, but he did not open his mouth. And he was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shears is silent, but he did not open his mouth. And he was taken from prison and from judgment. And, you know, he went before Pontius Pilate. And as for his generation, who considered that he shall cut off from the land, that he shall cut, be cut off from the land of the living? In other words, he was going to be executed. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. And he was appointed a grave with the wrong and with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there deceit in his, in his mouth. So... Uh, Anyway, Yahushua, Isaiah, or Yeshayahu chapter 53, discusses, you know, the events that concern themselves with the 14th day of the first month when he suffered. You know, and he's our Passover lamb. And he became the sin offering, and uh, he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So um, all we have to do is accept that. Mm -hmm and be immersed and we identify with his death and his burial and then his resurrection when we come out of the water and uh, it's just a wonderful simple thing yeah 
So we're witnesses uh, for him, you know, to, to all the people who would listen. And uh, immersion is going to be involved in the cleansing of our sins because we identify with his death, burial, and resurrection. So we become one with him. And then he enters into us and sits on the throne of our hearts. Anyway, did you want to talk about the meaning of the doves? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Definitely. Okay. Now, the, um, it's interesting because at the immersion of Yahushua, there was a, a dove that appeared to show the first work. The first work of Yahushua was one of death. And then his second work involves life. The first, uh, when he was being immersed, a dove appeared to show his first work. It was an identification for the cleansing of the leprosy of sin. And after immersion, we're legally declared clean in Mashiach. So immersion has to do with our leprosy too. Whenever you have leprosy, you're to dip yourself in the water. And uh, our bodies of sin and death are subjected to death. And at, at his second appearance, Yahushua will bring, a, a, at his appearing, we will receive a new body. And it'll be made incorruptible and it'll be free of all leprosy as well as sin. See, we're living in bodies of sin and death. Everybody knows that. But he being in our, in our, in our, in our minds, living it as our, uh, he's controlling us through his spirit, we're, we, have, we have eternal life. But our bodies are dying because we're, we're two components. So uh, the leprous part is going to decay and die. But in, Mal in Malachi 3, verse 1, it says, See, I am sending my messenger. Me the messenger he sent was Yahukanan, the priest. They called John the Baptist. And he shall prepare the way before me. And then suddenly the master you're seeking comes into his heckle, or temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. See, he is coming, said Yahuwah of hosts. And then if we jump to Yahukanan chapter 1, verse 29, on the next day, Yehuchanan, that's John the Baptist, saw Yehusha coming toward him, and he said, See, the Lamb of Elohim who takes away the sin of the world. Um, so this pattern actually started in the Garden of Eden, too, because mm -hmm. Yehua made coats of skin, no doubt from a lamb, for the man and his wife, and he dressed them. So Yehukan on the Immersal was actually answering Yitchak's question. Where is the lamb? Got, where is the lamb? The wood, and then the, he, the wood, the altar, <laughs> the journey, everything. Yeah. Where is the lamb? <laughs> yes. See, and, and Yehu is like that. He'll give you the answer to the question before you can even ask it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the, but in this case, Abraham and his son, Ishak, were walking along and and, the, and they had the fire and the wood, and little Ishak said, Father, where's the lamb? And uh, he said, My son Elohim shall provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering. Anyway, oh, was, he did. Was that the next page, was it? I'm going to have to shut up. Yeah. <laughs> I'll jump in the No, gun. no. No, you're fine. <laughs> anyway, he, he found a substitutionary uh, offering there. Yeah. Now, let's see. Uh, Yahushua is the way and the truth and the life. And uh, anyway, let's look at this uh, goat thing a little bit more, though. Because in Leviticus 16, it says, Then Aharon shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and shall confess over it all the crookedness of the children of Israel and all their transgressions in all their sins and shall put them on the head of the goat, and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a fit man, and the goat shall bear on itself all their crookednesses to a land cut off. Thus he shall send the goat away into the wilderness. So placing the thorns on Yahushua, placed as a symbol of the curse of sin upon his head, because the thorns were a symbol of the curse too. Mm. You know, thorns associated with the curse of sin, symbolic of, of sins, 
the sin's curse. Thorns placed on Yahushua's head as a sin bearer. Now, Genesis 3, verse 17 starts out saying, And to the man, he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree, which I commanded you, saying, Do not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In, in toil you are to eat of it all the days of your life. And, and the, ground, the ground shall bring forth thorns and thistles for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. Mm. So the thorns are a symbol of sin, too. So the, anyway, the, the symbol of sin is being taught to Israel all through time. The bite of the serpents in the wilderness and the people saw, it says in uh, Numbers 21, there's a reference in, starting in verse 5, and the people spoke against Elohim and against Moshe. Why have you brought us up out of Mitzrayim to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our being loathes this light bread. And Yahuwah sent fiery serpents, serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Then the people came to Moshe and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against Yahuwah and against you. Pray to Yahuwah and take away the serpents, serpents from us. So Moshe prayed on behalf of the people, and Yahuwah said to Moshe, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it, shall live. So Moshe made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And it came to be, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Now that's the very execution style that they put Yahushua in when he was lifted up. You know. And there's been many uh, mocking, mockeries of that in the Greek culture too. You know, the medical profession uses a serpent on a pole, you know, as a symbol of healing. But of course, uh, this was given in numbers a thousand years before the Greeks picked up on that, you know. So let's see. Um, now let's get back to the leprosy. The lamb's wounds are the thing that heals our hearts from all our leprosy. The leprosy of sin spread, spread from Adam, actually, to all mankind, and it brings death. Now, back to the two doves. The symbol, the meaning of the two doves, the, the two works of Yahushua. The two doves are described in Leviticus 14, verses 1 through 7, and Yahuwah spoke to Moshe, saying, This shall be the Torah of the leper for the day of his cleansing, he shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall look and see if the leprosy is healed in the leper. Then the priest shall command, and he shall take for him who is to be cleansed two live and clean birds, and cedar wood, and scarlet, and hyssop. See, all those are elements of the crucifixion, or the, uh, not the crucifixion, the execution of Yahushua. And it's uh, remembering the uh, deliverance of uh, the children from the world, from the uh, from Mitzrayim too, because they took hyssop and put the blood of the lamb on the lintels and the doorposts. So mm -hmm. all of these things are right there in that text: the hyssop and the and the wood, the cedar wood, which is you know like Yahushua was put on wood, nailed to wood. Now the two doves represent the two, we, the two works of Yahushua. And the priest shall command and he shall kill one of the birds in an earthen vessel over running water. Now let him take the live bird and the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop and dip them and the live bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed from the leprosy and shall pronounce him clean, and shall let the live bird loose in the open field. Now, so the first work was directly related to the second work, because Yahushua's robe is also, when he returns, is dipped in blood. Isn't that interesting? Wow. You know, because these are all uh, shadows of things that are to come. What's the running water? The running water is uh, probably the living water, you know, that represents the living water. 
but it also would probably reflect baptism or immersion you know because the immersion is part of the process for those two doves to cleanse Mm -hmm. a leper see cleansing a leper back then was literal but it also for it foreshadowed how the process was going to work with Yahushua's two works his one work of death and the 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 two doves represented those two works too and of course the elements like the water that would more than likely be the Torah the living water that he spoke of that springs up in us mm-hmm. into eternal life and flows out of us because it's the Torah and then also immersion in the water you know because so if he's, mm-hmm. sorry if his first work was death um, what is his second work when he comes back what's isn't his second work death as well no it's going to be life for life. for us and for, uh, uh, for, yeah for mm-hmm. us yeah and mm-hmm. here's where where he returns revelation 19 starting at verse 11 describes it and i saw the heaven open and there was a white horse and he who sat on him was was called trustworthy and true and in righteousness he judges and fights and his eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns having a name that had been written which no one had perceived except himself and having been dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of Yahuwah so his robe is dipped in blood because that that is a requirement for the one of the two doves now let's see um, knowing his name is important as well and it referred to a name that no one perceived other than himself and it seems odd that through all this time so many hundreds and hundreds of years his name has not been known or spoken because it's been hidden the dark ages and the the uh, people trying to destroy the the people of Yahuwah the dragon pursuing the woman and uh, Mm -hmm. you know it's interesting because in Psalm 91 his name is very important he says he commands his messengers concerning you to guard you in all your ways and they bear you up in their hands lest you dash your foot against the stone and you tread upon lion and cobra young lion and serpent you trample underfoot those are representations of demonic realms that we have authority over because he cleaves to me in love therefore I deliver him I set him on high because he has known my name when he calls on me I answer him I am with him in distress I deliver him and esteem him with long life I satisfy him and show him my deliverance and I think that reference to long life is a reference to eternal life because it's going to be long you know because our deliverance is really over the top it's amazing you know he's our husband and uh, you know the demonic realm is not so concerned with us but the deceptions that we're overcoming they're trying to gnaw at the edges of all the people that we know and love but uh, anyway in Yeshayahu chapter 54 it says no weapon formed against you shall prosper and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall prove wrong. This is the inheritance of the servants of Yahuwah and their righteousness from me, declares Yahuwah. Uh, anyway, when we're, uh, we're all looking to figure out from the chaos where we are on the planet. You know, the, the whole thing of it is, I think it was in 1879, a, a fellow named uh, Fleming, I think, invented, thought up, 24 time zones on the earth and it was based upon most of the maps were using London as the central uh, prime meridian and th- and then I think five years later they had a meridian meeting and they anyway it was back in the late 1800s that this prime meridian was thought up and then mm-hmm. of course the great circle reflected mm-hmm. back in the Pacific Ocean was the uh, you know international dateline which was the other side of this big circle. And, uh, you know, it, anyway, the time zones relative to one another didn't become a real issue until people were able to 
you know, they, the invention of the steam engine, as, as they say, was the real reason because people were moving quickly through the time zones and the railroads and people were getting confused about what time it was. You know, they were saying, what? You know, and then they started putting up telegraph poles and people were talking on there saying, well, what time is it there? Oh, you're wrong. It's this time. So they had to establish these refi these defined zones. And if you were in that zone, then it was a, it was that hour, you know. But then the day starts a, as a matter of human convention in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And you know, I don't know that Yahuwah would be uh, necessarily saying that was correct, but uh, he will wink at some of these human conventions. But anyway, when you're looking at the United States Naval Observatory's estimations of where the moon is going to be in its phases. The new moon was identified this year on the third Roman month on the 22nd day, uh, something like 5.37 p.m. in the evening, you know. So that was just before, it's like a day and a half before when the Hebrew calendars that we have actually say it was. That was you three know. days ago. No, it was more than, yeah, yeah, well, anyway, looking at uh, that, yeah, that, that's right. And then, and then we, when we move forward to the full moon, that, that's going to happen on the fourth Roman month, on the sixth day, something like uh, 7, 19 p.m., you know. And that works out fine for, that's the sixth day. So at, uh, in the evening, on the sixth day, the 15th day of the month starts at sunset. And that'll be the beginning of the full moon. So you see, sometimes one will be out of kilter with the other. But remember this, the new moon, when the uh, Naval Observatory says it happens, it's given these, time, it's using the time zones of uh, universal time or Greenwich, England, you know, but it's also uh, the be very beginning part. It's not the the middle of the. See, the new moon is dark for two days, you know, and if you go to the middle of those two days, which is the mean, you know, the real center when it when it first appears as a new moon, that's when it has no light on it at all, and then it has starts getting light on it almost two days later but right in the middle of it is what the um, the average of it is what we're talking about so people get real real confused when they look at the naval observatory and they don't realize that they're not using the mean they're not going to the average they're going to the you know but uh, they have to work this out somehow you know and the uh, the older brother has been doing this for thousands of years and I just want to be with the older brother so much that I'm not going to privately interpret when I want to start my month. Because if I'm one day away from the older brother, we're not walking together, how can two agree? You know, how can we agree? And, you know, I, I know that Yahusha is wanting us to obey the commandments. But remember, we're sliding all around the earth. We're, we're in 24 different time zones, you know. <laughs> so he's, he's really going to understand that we're confused. But we have to remember that we have to, these are shadows. And, we, and they, the moon is literally shadow. So we're, we want to be, first and foremost, the evidence that we love one another, that we're his disciples. Not the fact that we're observing together. If one, if one group says, I've got to wait for the sliver moon, and it's got to be there when I see it from my vantage point on the planet. You know, <laughs> well, if they see the new moon as a crescent in Jerusalem, that's saying that the first day is over and the second day is starting. But people will disagree about that, you know. Mm. And, so, uh, uh, Hold up that calendar again. The, oh, um, this calendar right here. Preparation night is T-H-U-R-S day. That's the fifth day night, isn't it? That would be the fifth day at, in the evening when, when we'll sit down and have a memorial of Yahusha's 
day of suffering. And we'll, re we'll, we'll have the elements of the, the, the bread and the wine. Now we'll also have a, a very important night of watching or watches on the f beginning of the 15th. So when preparation day, it happens to be this, this particular year, it's, it's Yom Shishi or preparation day that the 14th occurs. At sunset, we'll have the start of the weekly Sabbath and we'll also be coincidentally starting the annual Sabbath of the beginning of the first day of matzah. And for seven days, we're to not have any leavened bread in our homes, nor eat it when we're out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the following Sabbath, we can eat leavened bread. But these seven days right here, we can't, nor can we have it in our homes, in our environment. But uh, you're so absolutely the, right. The day of the day of first fruits is on a was on a sixth day, isn't it? Right before the weekly Sabbath. Yeah, we'll first be observing fruits. first fruits. Uh, what what are you saying now? Wait, tell me that again. I'm just saying uh, on the following week, the day of first fruits, the last day of the feast, is is basically a sixth day. Well, uh, that's uh, what we observe is, as I understand it, first fruits will be, uh, re you know, reflecting the uh, the resurrection, you know, and the wave sheath offering, right? And that would happen on the 8th. Yeah. Because it's always on the first day of the week. Oh, okay. It's the, the it's, last day of, it, it, the last day of unleavened bread. Yes. On the, the last day of unleavened bread is on the, on Yom Shishi. So they're two different things, are they? Yeah, yeah. I thought the last day of the feast was called First Fruits. Ah. No. So First Fruits is a separate thing. What what happened really was when when the Israelites came out of Mitzrayim or Egypt, they came out by a strong hand on the full moon, the 15th day of the month, and then they were out of there. And then seven days later, they were crossing the Sea of Reeds. And that's the day that they, there was a great deliverance also. They were delivered from the armies of the Pharaoh. So, but first fruits is when you get into the land. You have to read, you have to read Leviticus chapter 23. I believe it's um, verse 19. Let's see. Um, it says, speak to the children of Israel. That's Leviticus or Yaakra chapter 23. Speak to the children of Israel. No, wait a minute. This is, no, this is verse 10. In 23, verse 10, speak to the children of Israel, and you shall say to them, when you come into the land. Now, let that word echo in your head. When you come into the land, which I give you, and shall reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And he shall wave the sheath before Yahuwah for your acceptance. On the morrow, after the Sabbath, the priest waves it. And on that day, you shall wave the sheath, and you shall prepare a male lamb, a year old, a perfect one, as an ascending offering to Yahuwah. And what that would be is, this year, it would be the morrow after the Sabbath, within the week of Matzah, Here's the week of matzah. It starts off on the 15th day of the month. And it happens to be a weekly Sabbath this year. And then it goes through and it's seven days. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And that reflects the seven days of matzah from here to here. And during the week of matzah, on the morrow after the Sabbath, would be the first day of the week. So that would be first fruit. Right there. And that's the Yahushua raised it being resurrected? Yes. Only the sign of Yonah was in operation that year. Because, see, he was executed on um, the fourth day. He was meeting with his disciples on the 
the evening before that, executed this day. He went into the tomb at the end of that day and was in the tomb three days and three nights and resurrected mm -hmm. at the end of the Sabbath and then first fruits, you know. It's, if it's a high Sabbath menorah, it should probably be called last day of Passover. Well, the, oh, what those it. are are shadows, okay? And uh, okay. Th th they're... Uh, the shadows of things that were to come are, are to come for the body of Messiah are reflected in the festival of first. Well, first fruits is not so much a festival, but it's some, it's an observance that we that we see in our head, and it's very important. And instead of using, because see, there are seven annual Sabbaths. First fruits is not technically one of them. However, matzah has two of them, you know. And we just put Passover in there too. Uh, and it's not a Sabbath. You know, the 14th is, uh, but then Passover is is the lamb, you know. Uh, but then the first day of matzah is Passover, you know, the time of Passover, you know. I mean, it, it, it is because that's what it was in the days they came out of Mitzrayim, you know. But uh, you're absolutely right that there is, when we illustrate it that way, it, it gets confusing. But matzah represents mm -hmm. actually two Sabbaths because there's a Sabbath at the beginning on the 15th and then the 21st. Okay, great. See, so isn't that the 21st? So that's great. So this year you've got a, uh, a fifth day night, yeah. T-H-U-R-S day, night. So we do your preparation, uh, sorry, you do your uh, uh, remembering Yahusha with your bread yeah. and your wine and... You just try and stay up all night. Uh, you're vigilant. No, not that night. No? No, this isn't the night you stay up. <laughs> I'm trying to keep you easy. Yeah. Because, uh, no. The night of watches is actually always given as the beginning of the 15th. Ah. This is the night of watches. Now let's look at that because. Uh, so the first day. See, that would be. First day of unleavened bread. That's the night you stay up. Yes. Ah, yes. okay. Now, don't worry, because every year, Phyllis will tell you, we do this thing differently every year. Yeah. Because we're trying to figure it out. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but don't get uptight. It's, it, we're studying it. We're sh we're, they're shadows. But look at this. I'm going to try to find the night of watches here. Yeah. If I have written it down, that would be handy. Uh, here it is. Yeah. It's uh, in Exodus or Shemoth, chapter 12. Verse 42, it is a night of watches unto Yahuwah for bringing them out of the land of Mitzrayim. This is that night of watches unto Yahuwah for all the children of Israel throughout their generations. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's because they came out. See, the, the lamb was slain on the 14th. And that's a rec we recognize that, but it was eaten. When was it eaten? On the 15th. Mm -hmm in their houses and they were not to go outside their house at all on that night mm. now they were not to go outside their house mm. and Yahushua we know on the 14th did go outside mm. so he wasn't violating anything at all because he went to the Mount of Olives and or uh, Gethsemane you know mm. the oil press and went and prayed so Why not? while you're preparing on that uh, sixth day, you you can be remembering that this was a, around the time that Yahushua was actually slain. Yes. And the reason that I observe, as many observe, on the 14th at the beginning is because we're remembering that's the day that he suffered for our sins. Mm. And it would be very creepy for us to not give recognition to that day even though it's not a Sabbath day, it's a preparation day for the annual Sabbath. In fact, when they were together, you know, on the 14th, at the beginning of the 14th, when they were all, when the time had come and they were sitting down or reclining and all those things were happening that we remember, and he took the cup and, the, and he had the bread and they were discussing who it was that was going to, you know, betray him. All those things that were happening the man they called Judas, Yehuda, Judas was uh, 
the one that dipped the, the, the sop in there. And Yahushua told him, whatever you, what you have to do, do quickly. And they all heard him say it, and they assumed that he was going to go out because he was the keeper of the money bag. He was going to go out and have to buy something for the festival. And he went out, and it says, and it was night. Now, if he went out to go transact, and it was, a, and it was Sabbath, then that wouldn't have been something they would have thought. It was preparation day for the annual Sabbath. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in, in fact, this particular year, interestingly enough, no, it's much like the way the Catholics think it is because they think today is a preparation day. I mean, this, this coming 14th, is a preparation day, as Yahukana explains, because it's a preparation day not of the week, but a preparation day for the annual Sabbath. Hmm. You know, and that's what he was talking about. Because see, it happened here, really, and this was the annual Sabbath. You know, hmm. I just want to, I just want to say to the brothers and sisters, when Lou keeps saying the fourteenth day and the fifteenth day, you're talking about the Hebrew. Uh, the day of the moon. People last yeah. people last year on the YouTube were saying, "Oh, we did it on the fourteenth of, you know, the third, like, you know, we did it on the fourteenth. You know, so that's why I keep saying to you, what, what's the date? Is it the fifth of, you know, the fourth of of, of M A R C H, <laughs> or A? Uh, sorry, A A P R I L, the fourth month. Well, just so yeah, people don't get confused. Sure. Yeah, when we're saying these things, we're looking at two numbers here. This is the Roman date, which means yeah. absolutely nothing. Yeah. And then we've got the day of the moon down here, the 14th and the 15th. But it says the 7th of the fourth month. You know, it's mm. it's all messed up because the real month doesn't start. The real moon, the first day of the moon, is really, uh, you know, for me, it's mm. today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, and the, the Roman calendar says it's the 24th, and the word month means moon, yeah. you know, but uh, yeah, it's real confusing, so yeah. no one should get real distressed or upset, but you know, we're all struggling with this, and it, even though I've been doing this thing, I don't even know, 20-something years, hmm. every year I pour through this, and I struggle with it, because we're working with all this discombobulated stuff we're sliding <laughs> around the earth with 24 time zones we've yeah. got a roman calendar we've got islamic influences we've got the uh yahudim who have been doing this for thousands of years yeah. and i do have hope and that that part this is going to be an important part of the restoration yeah. but when you're looking at these little numbers you're looking at the at the day of the moon you know mm. and a lot of people argue about it yeah. So I'll just get it in my in my computer the correct way. On the uh, fifth day, that's the, and it's actually the fifth of A P R I L. We do a remembrance meal. That'll you be have, the beginning of the fourteenth. Yeah. You have a light meal. You you have your bread and your wine, and the husband, the, the head of the home, washes the feet, doesn't he? Yes. If you want it. Yeah. So, and that's not a vigil. You don't start late that night. The next no. day, the next day, or the same day, but the on Yom Shishi is a uh, preparation day for the High Sabbath, mm -hmm. and that is the sixth of A P R I L this year. And so that night, you have a feast. If you want to have a feast, you have the lamb. If you want to have a lamb, and that's the night of your vigil. Exactly. And you start. How do you try and stay up late? How do you, what do you do? <laughs> do you, just try to stay up. Yeah. Just try to stay up with the family, talking. We have a lovely time talking. Yeah. And, if you, and if, you're, if you think that you might feel confused, just look at that. Yeah. You know, oh man, is that messed up? And it's all, it's all hard to deal with, but you know, these are shadows and they're, uh, we're uh, remembering something that isn't something we have to do. It's something we have to observe, and it's something that we uh, remember with, mm -hmm. and we look forward to his coming back. But, you know, the, the Passover is essential 
and understanding. We don't necessarily have to know about the two doves, but that's prophetic and their shadows. And we don't have to necessarily know about the two goats, but those were prophetic shadows also, mm. you know, but they, it's good to know about them. Yeah, that's wonderful. So the day after the high Sabbath this year, which is actually a weekly Sabbath as well, that's the, the seventh of APRIL, you, the day after that is first fruits, the first day of the week. So we remember that Yahusha was, it's not a high Sabbath, but we remember that Yahusha right. rose, sh sh waved himself before the Father. That day. Mm. That's when he presented himself as the first fruits, yeah. Mm. And that resurrection is what the barley represents. Mm. See, when the high priest went to wave the barley, that was the, when they went into the land and they reaped the first fruits, they, they grabbed these little stalks of grain and bundled them up into an omer. And it was mm. a, like a little omer. It was a measured amount. And they would wave the omer, the high priest only. And that was, the, who knows what they thought it was. They, they, they were just told to do it. But the fulfillment of what that shadowed was Yahushua's own resurrection. Hmm. And then he went and waved himself the following day at the exact time he was supposed to. Uh, so there's a lot of wonderful things to reflect upon and understand that aren't because we typically come into a feast and go okay when's that when's that sabbath when do i have to take the day off work when do i have to take that day off work but aside from the days off work and the high sabbath there's you got your preparation day so you're reflecting on yahushua's own death for you and for i and then on the first day of the week you've got him raising there's no point if you didn't raise Mm-hmm. Yes. So, that's yeah, these are these are all things that'll play uh into a person's mind at first as being very foreign, but after some contemplation and meditation, it's it's really simple. You mm -hmm. have you have a deliverer, a redeemer, who is the Lamb of Elohim that you're remembering suffered on that day of the fourteenth because he was slain on that day. That's not Passover, he is the Passover. The lamb is the Passover. And uh, we can't get uh, too confused about that, but we still do. And next year, I'm probably going to be just as much uh, st studying this as hard as I can now uh, as I am right now. I'm going to yeah. be looking at the Naval Observatory and yeah. making sure everything's going to be okay. But sometimes, the, like I say, the Naval Observatory will say, this happened this day, and it looks like it's two days later that, like this year, that the Hebrew calendar starts, because, yeah. you know, it's really, like, what's it say? It, it starts. Uh, the Naval Observatory says that it started on the twenty second, and the Hebrew calendar says it started the first day of the month is here. That's because the dark moon extends over two days. Hmm. So it's see the days in the in the in the moons, our day and night is not linked or geared in any way to the moon. It's, mm. And besides that, we've got 24 different time zones. And that didn't start until 1879, yeah. you know. And it wasn't recognized even as five years later, really. Five years <laughs> later, they came up with a, a little yeah. idea that, you know. But uh, we're, we're going to be okay. We're just in captivity, and we're doing the very best we can. Yeah. You know, and you're, what are you, uh, 14 hours ahead of us? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Well, there you go. 14 mm -hmm. hours ahead of us. And so when it's, uh, there, there's one example. See, there's people that are 24 hours ahead of us at yeah. some point, you know. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're a whole day ahead of us, you know. <laughs> Is there, um, so I've got that now. I understand the beginning of the week. As far as the end of the week of matzah, unleavened bread, on that last high Sabbath there, is um, is there anything significant on that day, high Sabbath, in the life of Yahusha? Did he significantly uh, fulfill anything there, or is it really just pointing to the day they came through the the yam suf? Well, it would have if if we understand the parting of the sea as being related to the whole nation of Israel entering into the covenant coming mm -hmm. under, you know, one one cloud, Yahushua mm -hmm. is very much involved. 
because yeah. he's a, his, his ultimate deliverance was completed at that point and that is mm -hmm. symbolic of immersion yes mm -hmm. i'm glad you brought that up wow. so he's very much in every every aspect of the deliverance when they came out of egypt at that point so we can remember that we were all immersed Slaves. under the whole all the nation and all the scattered israelites today that are all over the earth relate back to that too that's a very good point and then you know this the song of moshe was sung on that day there's a whole lot of things that happened on that day yeah. that's kind of that's kind of relating to the two two doves a little bit isn't it because the, at the beginning of the week he died and at the end of the week we live we are re, we not reborn but re what's the word <laughs> Redeemed. redeemed yeah we're redeemed redeemed, yeah. redeemed. <laughs> yes yeah 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 amazing. it's amazing but uh you know and then of course uh seven full complete weeks from the point where the wave she this is first fruits seven weeks from that point seven complete weeks mm -hmm. until tomorrow after the seventh sabbath is shabuot mm -hmm. Mm. that's going to be easier I think to track yeah. not for everybody though yeah. you know because some people are going to insist no it's a month later and that's it's that's going hard. around <laughs> yeah, it's a bit hard are. to count to 49 isn't it <laughs> yeah and then what happens is that people mm. forget that they started a month late and then they find out wait a minute I only had 11 months last year what happened Yeah, because <laughs> they're doing yeah. their own thing yeah. If you start a month late, then spring's yeah. going to come up on you before you know it. And then, oops, unless you just keep postponing spring. But yeah. actually, in Hebrew, there's only two seasons. There's the warm season when in the northern hemisphere when the sun mm -hmm. gets at the equator. And, and actually, it's called kayats because it has to do with life. The life of the plant world comes back, and that's called summer. That's what Yahu, that's what Yahuwah's word calls summer. And that's why Yahushua was saying, when you see the things starting to bud and blossom, you know summer is near. And that's what he's talking about. The Tekufa is when the sun is at the equator. And he's talking about summer. He's not talking about spring. We there's not four seasons. There's only what summer. What does Tekufa mean? Well, Tekufa has to do with a cycle. You know, it has to do with okay. the Hebrew root word kug, which means a circle or a cycle. And it has to do with the, the, either the ending of a, of a cycle or the beginning. And that is a tekufa. And that's when mm -hmm. the sun reaches the equator and summer begins for the northern hemisphere. And then mm -hmm. uh, the, the opposite of that is when the sun gets at the equator and it's starting to go down for us, it becomes what they call koref which is winter. So there's mm -hmm. only Koraf and Kayats. Those are the only two seasons that Yahuwah even discusses. Mm -hmm. You see? So we, we, we tend to combine, or we, we've made it into four, spring, summer, fall, and winter, you know, depending on which way the sun's going. And, but uh, there's really just two, and, it's, and it has to do with the equator of the earth and where the sun mm -hmm. is, when the sun gets to the equator. And then, and it passes north or it passes south. And of course, for you guys, it's quite different, you know, but you all are thinking about the northern hemisphere because these things were laid down in context for the northern hemisphere. So the whole planet yeah. is keeping a time according to that. Yeah. In, in any way. So, mm -hmm. so if we're expecting, uh, if we've done it correctly, a full moon on the first day of unleavened bread when do we start calculating if you wanted to counting to Shabuoth where where do you start counting one day two days three days up to 49 days where do you start that count from well you'd start it from first fruits that's what it says in in, Levi in, in uh, Leviticus 23 and in Deuteronomy 16 they both say the very same thing and it calculates, uh, let's see if we can find that. Let's see. 
Way for it. And, that, mm -hmm. and that's always going to be a first day of the week because it's always yeah. going to be the morrow after the Sabbath. Mar uh, the morrow after the Sabbath. When you... What? Mm -hmm. well, that makes it easy to count, doesn't it? It's just seven, uh, seven weeks. Right, right. Let's see here. Uh, it, that talked about that. Then... Uh, and from the morrow, it, this is uh, Leviticus chapter 23, starting at verse 15. And from the morrow after the Sabbath, now it's referring to the, to the first day of the week within the festival of Matzah. From the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, you shall count for yourselves seven completed Sabbaths. Now that's actual weeks, mm. you know. Until the morrow, after the seventh Sabbath, you count 50 days. Then you shall bring a new grain offering to Yahuwah. And there it is. So that's, that's the festival of Shabuoth, and it actually means weeks. Because Shabuah mm -hmm. is week, seven completed yeah. Sabbaths. And uh, Shabuah is the word for week, and seven... Um, 49 days is seven, seven Sabbaths and then the morrow after makes it the 50th day and uh, mm. you know it's easy to do the math now if you're uh, not keeping it correctly you're going to find yourself arriving at seven Sabbaths sooner than that because you're mm. going to be we won't mention that <laughs> oh <boy. laughs> Yeah, we don't, we don't want to use the moon to work out our Sabbath, do we? Mm, no, not that. Uh, the moon is going to set uh, the festivals, and it, and it's given in Leviticus 23 separately. See, because mm. Leviticus 23 says, And Yahuwah spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Yisrael, and say to them, The appointed times of Yahuwah, which you are to proclaim as set-apart gatherings, my appointed times are these. Six days work is done. There's no moon involved. Just six days. Mm. We, the work is done. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, a set-apart gathering. You do no work. It is a Sabbath to Yahuwah in all your dwellings. Then he starts over again and mm. says, These are the appointed times of Yahuwah, the set-apart gatherings which you are to proclaim at their appointed times. In the first new moon, on the fourteenth day of the new moon, between the evenings, is the Pesach to Yahuwah. Okay? Now, on the fourteenth day, that means that that's when the lamb is slain. That's, the, that's what he's referring to. You know? And on the fifteenth day of this new moon is the festival of Matzah. Mm -hmm. So, to um, sum up the lamb's legacy... It's kind of tied up in the two doves, isn't it? Uh, Yahushua came, mm -hmm. he was dipped in blood, his first work was to die, mm -hmm. and his second work is going to be coming back as a lion, riding on the <laughs> riding on the clouds, bringing everlasting life. Right. And if we want to be involved in yeah. that process, then we have to be dipped in the blood, mm -hmm. through immersion, the running water, and we have to have our garments Yes, and we, and we will be, our garments of righteousness uh, will be, of course, the obedience of, of his commandments, but the righteousness of the saints is uh, metaphorically the white robes. However, the leprosy, that the process of the cleansing operation of the two doves, you know, it, it, that's given in Leviticus, is uh, very critical to understanding how leprosy is cleansed mm -hmm. and he's operating mm -hmm. in the in that picture you know and his death and mm -hmm. one bird dies and the other living bird is dipped in the blood of the of the dead bird mm -hmm. uh, over running water <laughs> with hyssop mm -hmm. and cypress wood you know so all these elements are talking about his death you know mm -hmm. and then uh, it's in it, and the cleansing of leprosy you know so it's it's a it's amazing to not notice that we were uh that sin is leprosy and that's our big problem we inherited it from adam so we he has solved that problem though 
This is a wonderful book. This is a hardcover, large print. Yeah. Large print's good, isn't it? Yeah, it sure is when you're not wearing glasses. Uh, in this, yeah. I, I, it's dim in here today. Adam doesn't want to hurt my eyes anymore. Last week, he had the light right there behind, and it was blazing right in my face. And there was another one over here. And I had a blind spot for like a whole day and a half or two. And I mean, when I closed my eyes, all I saw was this big rectangle. <laughs> and I Damn. thought I was damaged. You know, that's why I was praying, uh, asking you guys to pray for me. And uh, yeah. it, was a, it was a painful thing sitting here, you know. Yeah. Because these babies are bright. They're face, there's two of them right here now. They're facing the other way. They're actually lighting up that, that screen back there. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. So what mountain did you say I was sitting on? Well, uh, I was thinking if we were to have the Temple Mount in the background. Is that Mount Horeb? Is that Mount Horeb? No, no, the Temple Mount. The uh, Temple uh, Temple Mount is uh, where the temple had been built, you know, where Mount Moriah. Moriah. Yeah, hmm. Mount Moriah. And that's, where, that's where Abraham took his son. Yes, we assume that it was in the very same spot, either that or it was possibly um, right there on the Temple Mount. That's what most yeah. people understand. And, yeah. uh, of course, Yahushua was executed outside the Temple Mount, but it was within view of the Temple Mount, you know. That's interesting because the goat had to be taken outside the outside of the uh, the camp, didn't it? With yes. The, the rope around its neck. Yes, it was led out of the camp, but it wasn't killed outside the camp, mm. you know. Okay. But, uh, but the, the, the whole point is it's, uh, you know, it, it, Golgotha is a, is a distinct place, you know, and it may be that that was where it was, but the Temple Mount is generally thought of as being the, the threshing floor that Daoud bought. You know, Daoud, the, the King David, as they call him, he bought that, you know, and it was to stop a, a plague too, you know. It was a, because he counted the, the armies of Israel. Remember when he did a census? King David was, he sinned because he had ordered that Israel be counted. And in his heart, he, he thought that that was the thing that was making, you know, the, the the strength of the nation and uh, Yahuwah started to send a, a messenger out that was slaying you know the people and he said oh no I'm the one that's uh, guilty please let, let this curse fall upon me and my household and uh, mm -hmm. he he pleaded to have something uh, done to stop this and so uh, you know he bought that property and the uh, Islamic mm -hmm. people have a have have usurped it of course you know they but david paid good money in fact the man that owned the property wanted to just give it to him as well as the oxen and the and the cart and uh he said oh no i would not offer to you what did not cost me something you know he he wanted to pay him for it and he did yeah mm. so that property uh david bought it mm. yeah Wow. The Temple Mount's a wonderful place. It's not so pretty right now, but it is the place where Yahuwah has placed his name. Hmm. Yeah. Well, brothers, brothers and sisters, we hope we haven't made it too confusing for you. But as Lou said, I mean, we it's going to be confusing because unlike the pagan holidays, Christmas is there. You know, Christmas Eve is there. Boxing Day is there. It's very easy. They make it easy for you to understand. Because our minds are so stuffed coming out of the world it's, it's always going to be a touch of confusion there because yeah we're coming into the light and we're totally dark in our minds half the time particularly when we're trying to find out dates to things oh yeah. so i think you've i think we've, we've done okay i'll put a bit of a chart up as well <laughs> yeah that would that would help to help yeah. them out but yeah. uh, don't follow men just follow what scripture says yeah you know well, and okay. if i have errors here it's just because I, I'm, I'm a person, and I'm and like I say every year, uh, Phyllis says we do it differently every year. What's going on? And it's because we're we're studying all, all the time. Now, if we ever get fixed, 
in our in, in whatever era we're in, then we'll be stubborn, you know. But we're always open and and studying, and and we're we're all over the earth, so we have to, you know, accept one another. That's the sign that we are his taught ones, his his disciples, that we have love for one another, and we can't miss that point. If we miss that, then nothing, all knowledge and wisdom isn't going to matter, you know, because that's the main thing. That's the goal. So the important thing, brothers and sisters, is that even if you miss the mark this year or you get the Sabbath day wrong or you watch this the day after the Sabbath and realize, oh, it was yesterday, the main thing is in a, in a couple of weeks, uh, and odd 2,000 years ago, Yahushua died for you and was raised from the dead there for you. That's so, right. And he's the Passover. That's the main thing. Yeah. Our eyes are always fixed on him and yeah. what he is doing and what he has done and what he's going to do. It's nothing yeah. to do with anything we can, we can possibly do. It's uh, yeah. All we can do is observe and try to understand and try to teach those truths. And uh, what day it may be uh, is, is not as important as, uh, as, as much as we want to make it right. We all do. And the yeah. ones that, uh, that judge the others, they're going to have to answer for that. You know, we want to make sure that we understand it as well as we can and everybody understands it as well as they can in their own mind. And and there's not going to be a problem for them as long as they don't start judging others. You yeah. know, yeah, that's where the real danger is. So we want to uh, understand it and uh, analyze it. And uh, if the Hebrew calendar uh, may be a day off, even then mm -hmm. we're still in unity and... Don't worry too much about it, but mm -hmm. yeah, that's wonderful, brother. Well, I he's wonderful. A lot more. Yeah. Mm. Well, it's uh, mm. going to be the same way every year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get used to learning. Yes. Mm. Okay. So you have a you have a seminar next week. Yes, sir. I do. Uh, and the first day of the week. And you're talking about the uh, bunny rabbit season. Well, we're going to try to discuss that and discuss some of the elements of uh, the pagan history of that. And m maybe we'll get into why it's wrong and and maybe we ought to get more on track with what the scriptures wants us to do and identify who the mother of harlots is. And it happens to be named, you know, because on the face of their festival that they call the resurrection, they use the word E-A-S-T-E-R, and that is the name of the mother uh, the, of harlots, you know, mm. and how she's uh, decep deceived the world. Um, mm. You know, and the dragon gives authority to the beast, and the woman rides the beast, you know, and the ancient Babylonian name is right there. All they have, you know, in the mistranslation of it in, in Acts 12, you know, is, un, you know, it's it's wrong. You know, it needs to be corrected to Passover. You know, because mm -hmm. it was the word Pesach or Pascha. You know. Mm -hmm. Well, you have a wonderful week ahead of you, and get some good uh, rest of the rest of the day if you can. Yeah. And uh, so, so next month, next week is the first uh, weekend of the month. You've got your seminar. Second weekend, we'll put the girls on. Okay. And then the third and fourth week, and if there's a fifth in a month, we'll we'll party on. Okay, we tell jokes or whatever. <laughs> well, I, I really enjoyed seeing you. Yeah, you too, brother. Yeah. And I, I'm Wonderful. sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so tired, but I had a really, really <laughs> rough week. That's yeah. all right. No problem. Okay. We're, everybody's tired. Love you, mate. Love you, and we'll see you see all you later. Time. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yahushua's blood cannot wash clean So open up your heart to Him And feel His wondrous love So passionate is He for you And He longs for you to believe it's true So see what He surrendered He thought that you were worth it 
put on sin's mortality just so you could know he was pierced for our transgression bruised for our iniquity the punishment that brought our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed through his blood we have been sealed the hand that passed us Crushed our King, the perfect offering, an offering. He was pierced for our transgression, bruised for our iniquity. The punishment that brought our peace was upon.